Uh, suicide for celluloid, another response. This one is just to a comment that you left on my previous video. Um, you questioned why someone would use such profoundly negative metaphors to describe reality, i.e. suffering as a deficit, um, uh, any kind of um, pleasure or any kind of enjoyment of life is merely feeding an addiction. In other words, um, putting a negative spin on everything. Um, why would someone do that? Well, I don't know if you've ever had a moment or several moments, <laughs> heaven forbid, of existential panic. Um, it looks as though Zapfe, Peter Vessel Sopfe, in The Last Messiah, describes sort of the worst crisis that can strike a human being psychologically, where you simply panic at the realization of your own existence and your own ensnarement in phenomenal reality. You suddenly understand what all this is. I use Stephen King's metaphor of a puppet who comes to life only to realize that he's on strings and he's going to stay on strings and the look on that puppet's face when he realizes what this means. <laughs> um, you understand what's going on, and you understand that you are trapped. Um, there's an element of this in some faiths, a lot of religious traditions. Uh, Jainism in particular seems to look at phenomenal reality, the physical universe, this way. Um, if you've ever felt that way, if you've ever actually had a period of existential horror, not just existential crisis, i.e. the guy about my age who questions everything about his life and wonders if there's any value or merit to it, you know, any, did he leave any imprint on the world or does anyone care or that he ever existed, that kind of thing. Um, I say he because uh, to my understanding it's by and large a male thing, but I suppose it happens to women too. Um, what I mean is panic, where you are suddenly, the veil is lifted and you are in a state of blind horror at it all. <laughs> um, I'm not really sure if anyone can discuss that unless you've actually experienced it. And even then, words tend to fail. Safi does his best to uh, describe it. Um, the only other person I've ever spoken to or interacted with on YouTube who seems familiar with the term existential panic is a fellow by the name of I am you, you are me. Um, it's a state of the most primal of primal horrors. You will do anything to avoid that void, that that state of horror vacui, horror, horror of the vacuum, uh, fear of the void. You will do anything. Sophie says that we will um, anchor ourselves. Uh, we will um, unilaterally and arbitrarily create all these structures um, to make sense out of this gigantic void that so horrifies us. We'll invent things like religion, government, um, philosophy, uh, e economics, politics, all this kind of thing, simply as a means of distracting us. Now, anchoring and distraction and this kind of thing um, are essentially just means of occupying our minds to keep it away from that void. Um, like it or not, <laughs> ethelism is a form of certainty. At least you've discovered that. However negative uh, you might find in Mendham's point of view, um, it at least posits a structured universe. I can understand the attraction to that. Um, at least you know what's what. Now I've had some, <clears throat> excuse me, I've had some interactions with I don't know if they're ethelists or not, but just I call them morbid antinatalists, who 
have come out and said this, even though they say, no, no, that's not, Zapfi isn't saying that this is a good thing that we anchor and we distract. It's just, um, it's just what we do. It's a defense mechanism. But then they, then when you probe them a little bit further, they say, look, we have to have these structures. Otherwise, we can't talk about anything. Otherwise, the universe is a complete void that is completely and utterly nonsensical and non-graspable. Well, the fact that the universe is nonsensical and non-graspable doesn't make your artificial props any less artificial. Um, we have logic and we have reason and we have philosophy and we have our cognitive faculties and all this kind of thing to help us deal with reality. Um, but these, even these things are our own creations. Um, the very fact that we've evolved these things doesn't make them real. Uh, the very fact that they don't ultimately describe reality the way it actually is, is no fault of reality. It's a fault of our tools. Um, the very fact that maybe all of our uh, means of coping with reality, all our means of coming to terms with this great void, are inadequate is more of a reflection on our tools than on the uh, uh, the ultimate nature of reality. Um, it's you can't say that we've got to assume that reality is a certain way, otherwise it won't make any sense at all, because you still don't know whether or not you've actually gotten reality correct. <laughs> uh, you still don't know whether or not you've come to terms with Zopfe's panic. That terrible moment of crisis where you see the void and there is nothing in the cosmos except you and the void. That is the most primal of primal horrors. Um, compared to being in that state, ephilism is preferable. <laughs> That's what I think uh, is at work here. Um, Again, it goes to, I guess, a certain sort of negative determinism where <clears throat> there's no good to be had in this universe. There is only bad to be escaped from. Uh, there's no counter void. There's just the void. That big black hole of nothingness that goes on forever that we're staring at. There is no... Uh, mirror image of that, that is positive, that is good, that is desirable, that is pleasant, that is peaceful, calm, uh, wh whatever terms you care to use, th that doesn't even exist. The only thing of value is escape from the void. So if you create a logical structure that looks pretty horrific, and you wonder, and, and or if someone else does this, and you wonder why on earth they would embrace this model. Remember what you know how negative utilitarianism works. Um, it's not about anything good. It's about escaping badness. <laughs> um, and I can see how someone who sees the universe in those terms would find something appealing in morbid antinatalism. Um, they might agree with Schopenhauer or whomever. Mahavira of the Jains, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> the universe is simply something to be escaped from. Although the Jains, to my understanding, at least say that however hard, nigh on impossible it is to reach some sort of state of bliss, it is possible. Um, but the universe is, there's, there's absolutely nothing of value here at all. The only thing to do is to get away from it. Um, I'd say that Gary sort of posits a universe where there isn't even that um, goal in mind. There's no goodness. There's simply nothing is the desired goal. Non-existence. We seem to have two choices in his view of the universe. Uh, we live in this horrible swamp of desire and death and blood and urine and mucus and all that kind of thing, this dog-eat-dog -dog gladiator world, 
or we don't exist at all. Um, others would say that we don't even have that choice because the dog-eat-dog -dog world isn't really the problem. The problem is the terrible void we're staring at. The existential panic. And even the dog-eat-dog -dog world, I guess, they would say is preferable to that. Um, that, to me, is the appeal of that kind of a point of view. It's not so much that it's a good point of view. It's that it's better than something that its adherents probably have faced. If you've had that moment of existential horror, it's not the kind of thing you're likely to forget anytime soon. <laughs> um, I believe it can be coped with, come to terms with. You know, I won't say overcome, um, but I would say that it is something that one can integrate into a larger world view or larger philosophical point of view. Just because the void is real, in other words, and inevitable, and crushing, and terrifying, it doesn't automatically follow that that's all there is. That, too, could be an illusion.